The Image of the Damned by Alex Hamilton I served my apprenticeship with heads which impatient hands tore from mine in order to set them on pikes. It could be said, therefore, that almost from the start the efforts of my fingers were succeeded by frantic applause from the gallery. I cannot forget how they cheered. The executioners for hurrying, myself for taking my time. These frantic, clambering wretches who thronged to see the guillotine fall, who fought, literally, for better vantage points on roof gutters and tradesmen's ladders, gave their work a day, sport and plaudits to the executioners who loomed over the scaffold, and their respectful souls to me, who worked in wax in its shadow. But it was chance that it happened that way. I would not have chosen to begin with the dead, but I was young and opportunist, and I seized my chance. An artist looks for power only to use it, power, at the moment that my fingers first felt their dexterity, chanced to be in the hands of cutthroats. It gave a direction to my life, but the sequel was my own doing. In the later days of my fame, my waxes have been applauded by soft and delicate palms. I have bowed and been sleek and grateful, for there is power and patronage in white feminine palms. But their acknowledgement of my skill, like the sound of velvet waterfalls in the halls of the great, has never ceased to evoke for me that first stupendous, crashing enthusiasm of the mob. At a time when a white, uncalloused hand was an offending hand. Spontaneous applause, unfaked and unreflective, is the one influence among so many that we who worked in wax share with artists in every medium. Once in my life I had a tribute to my work which went beyond the praise of any palms, be they white as bridal sheets, be they red as scaffold steps. Who knows what strange superstition in the revolutionaries compelled these beasts, who wanted to obliterate a world, to perpetuate the image of their dead in wax? Was it first as a joke that they caused poor Marie Groschaltz, whom you may know as Mademoiselle Toussaud, that sweet royalist lady, to cast the death masks of so many of her friends? Was it as a rider to this bitter jest that they brought me from the slaughterhouse, who had never used better material for his little statues than the tallow melted down from ox tripes to help her. They thought my aplomb was due to the oceans of blood I had seen flow in the abattoir, but they were wrong. I learnt it from Marie, who saw not a herd going to its death, but every time a separate, special way of meeting death, which is not to be found in ox and sheep and swine. Look at her waxes. She was an artist. Revenges. And we had our revenges. In time, we collected the executioners themselves. The terrorist, Robespierre, sneezed into the basket and we blew his nose for him. Charlotte Corday dealt with Marat in his bath and we were tempted to agree with her that he died not as a man but as a beast. Only the scruples of our art overcame this human weakness. And then came the great day when the public accuser himself, Farquhar Tinville, whispered, I am not well. I see the shadows of the dead following me. It was indeed a mortal sickness. How dark with shadows must the basket have looked to Farquhar Tinville when he, in his turn, waited those seconds before the knife fell. Of course, Marie herself worked on in this shambles with the knowledge that the joke might cease to be amusing, at which point she would no doubt be invited to take a ride in a tumbrel. Only once did she ever reveal this thought to me when she remarked quietly one day when more heads had been severed than we had wax for, that she hoped when you are required by the new despots to make the image of Marie Groschholz, you will remember the mind that animated her, not merely the sin that killed her. 
In her case at least, you have had the opportunity of study. Naturally, I answered that I did not believe it could ever come to that, and I thank the fates that it never did. Shame, they used to say to us, lies not in the scaffold, but in the crime. But had she died there, I could not have endured to work on without her. Yet that exchange between us itself deepened my understanding of her, and the attention she gave to her, because of her I can say our, art. She taught me not merely the secret process of mixing chalk and clay and paint, and the potency of wax, but the deeper, more secret roots into the psyche of our subjects. She taught me to understand the skeleton as the natural man, and to study whether the flesh had been its friend or its enemy. From these beginnings I came to perceive how many men and women conceal themselves from themselves, and I perceived the beginning of knowledge in myself when one night during that time of carnage I picked up with a plump young trollop in a tavern, and did her will to drive the reeking daylight scenes from my brain, only to see behind the fat thighs and globular breasts of a carefree voluptuary, the suffering femur and close little ribs of a seamstress. But I fancy that another man would never have seen any deeper than her dimples. All the same we made love. Of course I'm not daft, and I'm not wax, yet. We knew the prison officers, Marie and I. She made it plain that was important. I thought at first that she insisted on this for the sake of our own survival, but as the business got into my blood and the joke turned to earnest, I realised again that all this great little lady's reasons derived from the love of her art. I was to get to know the workings of the prisons, the tricks and the triumphs of the men who administered them, their dust and their damps, their corridors and cells, their tortures and their pleasures on the side, their very architecture and where the light might fall on a murderer's pallet, for a great scheme of hers which I was to bring to fruition. We would travel the world together with waxen figures, hers would be the gallery of the famous, while my lot, my province, my novelty would be the infamous. You shall see, she said, how grand you will become with your chamber of horrors. I need not tell you how true a prophet she was. I am bold enough in my turn to prophesy that her collection will last until the sun comes close enough to melt not only our waxes, but the flesh of the men who guard it. I owe it all to Marie but she would not say I have not repaid the debt. She lent me a talent and, as the parable recommends, I have returned it tenfold. This I avow at some cost to the shape of my own flesh, which has compromised with my virtuous skeleton. For in the dreams which shrouded my working studies, I have lifted the knives of murderers, yes, and scissors, and hatchets too, to drive them into quivering, startled flesh. I have brooded over poisons in hidden cabinets and uttered hypocritical kindnesses at the bedside of stricken victims. I have laid my sights along the masked barrels of a regicide's infernal machine and watched the random blast extinguishing the lives of blameless spectators. I have waited down alleys with the stink of cabbage and fish heads carried in the fog about me with a hook in my hand and walnut juice darkening my skin, to sweep the pedestrian with a few shillings into oblivion. I have torn the clothing from women foolish enough to cross the heath while the moon was a baby and, like a baby, swaddled in clouds, and I've begged them, exhorted them, prayed to them not to struggle while I doused the ungovernable brand at my crotch and then cursed them for obliging me to quench their spark of life. All these and a thousand other mazes I wandered in search of the quality of the Minotaur, talking 
in condemned cells to men and women who in the main had not known the maze lay beyond the picturesque kissing gate where they entered. And I must not forget that there were among these creatures of strange experiences a certain few whose flesh was at one with their unnatural skeletons. I waxed them accordingly, while they looked on with a smile and usually, before I had done, they were offering me their clothes to perfect the job. Well, of course, I accepted graciously and forbore telling them that was the arrangement I had with the executioners anyway, that for a consideration they should rescue the clothes from the line. These were the criminals whose appetite was whetted by my activities, who made a hearty meal of their last dinner on pig and plum sauce, and smacked their lips at the idea of immortality in my chamber. For the great majority, however, the moment when their cell door was unlocked for me, and my pots, and my colours, was a dreadful moment. It was the instant of doom itself. For I liked time in which to work, and to get time I had to make my decision long before the jury came to theirs. In prison every man's action has its special meaning. Every gesture and expression carries its prediction of hope or despair. And when we had removed to England and my career was set on a regular official footing, my purpose was clear enough to the inmates. Once it was known that I had a nose for conviction, even the governor understood that the scaffold carpenters could be called upon to look out their equipment. I did not discourage the spread of my reputation as a shrewd tradesman. In England, particularly, it is a quality above all others which bears with it the idea of discretion of word and action. I came and went from my appointed rendezvous without interference. As my little gallery grew, I was proud to play host, in my turn, to all the elements of the law. These were the men who had apprehended the miscreants, the turnkeys who had helped me, the prison officers who preened themselves before the evidence of their usefulness to society, the members of Parliament who went from my presence with a renewed assurance that the country was in need of more stringent measures to make war on the underworld. Lastly, I at least could pick them out from our visitors. We welcomed the underworld itself, awed at my skill and fearful of being the object of my special study. All these and the thousands who came in off the streets to stare, to remember and to fall silent if the idea crossed their minds that these deadly figures were not unlike those living beings among whom they were then jostling, gave me praise for the very similitude of my craftsmanship, and I never wearied of it. But an artist is never content. He is always hoping for an event which will be a proof of his mastery, beyond all critical expression that his fellows can utter. Of all the tributes which were given me, none pleased me more than the astonished children who shrank into the skirts of their mothers at sight of my waxen rogues. But even this fell somewhat short of unqualified proof of success. You may have seen me passing through your town on tour with our collection, and you may have heard me speak gracefully acknowledging the world's enthusiasm. But you have never before heard from me of the event which gave me proof positive. Until now, the secret has been kept as faithfully as we have guarded the knowledge of how we make up our wax. I tell it now because my fingers are stiffening, and the wax will no longer mould as my still eager mind would have it. I shall never again lift the knocker at Newgate. Very often, Patrons of our show inquire why we do not include the Honourable James Beresford among our exhibits, to which I am wont to reply that an untimely aggravation of the chronic gout which had first afflicted me in the days when I stood ankle-deep in the slaughterhouse bloodbath crippled me and kept me in my bed during the time that that remarkable rake awaited sentence and the carrying out of that same. But... The truth 
is elsewhere. The truth is that I was never so well in my life that I spent many hours until the very eve of the execution date with the Honourable James and that the wax that I made of him, with his generous help and well-informed comment, was among the very best of my creations, fit to stand in the front rank before royalty itself. But neither the curious eye of royalty nor the speculative eye of the paying customer ever looked into the defiant blue of the eyes I set into my study of the Honourable James. He had been a great gambler of a kind that Crockford's in these weak days when women have more bottom than the men, never sees. He would gamble thousands on a race between two unknown beggars, on the breed of the next dog to come round the corner, on the depth of a newly discovered cave, on the leader in next day's times, on the colour of a beauty's underpinnings. It was while resolving a bet of this last kind that he gambled on the absence of the lady's husband and, well, he won the first part of the bet, he lost the second. The cuckold died there that night, and he was brought to justice. He made a brave figure in the dock, being tall and well built. While I flatter myself that among observers I was one of the very few who could read the story of his dissipations in his countenance. So at the outset he was not without his sympathisers among the fair who flocked into the well of the court. Had these ladies troubled to ask my advice, they would have stayed away. A court is a kennel for the hounds of fate. Once in it, there is no reputation, however gay, which can long sustain itself without being torn to splinters of greed and the bleeding tissue of lust. Shall I ever forget the shock on the faces of his admirers when it became plain that the greatest erotic capacity that the Honourable James could muster was a direct consequence of his laying a wager. Then only could he guarantee his ante. As this whisper spread, I could see, looking about me, that they would not forgive him for that. It was, as I say, a whisper that put the news about, which I believe Milud was never conscious of, for had he been so, he would most certainly have cleared the court in a trice and conducted the remainder in camera. Nevertheless, there was enough said in question and answer, appearing in the records, to prove the Honourable James Beresford thought and felt very differently from the ways natural to flesh and blood, and not forgetting bone. Those who wish to look up the records may do so. I will only here recall the amazing defence of the Honourable James that he had sat down to cards with the lady's husband while she looked on from the great four-poster and played for it and all it contained. Her evidence corroborated this, but took the story farther perhaps than he had bargained, for she averred that when her husband lost and thereupon put a pistol ball through his right eye, she turned away from her lover in horror, and now for the first time in all the long parade of his gallantry was he able and determined to possess her in good earnest. The Honourable James Beresford was sentenced to wear the devil's hempen collar, not for murder, but for rape. Myself, already interested in the Honourable James as a potential subject, had no need to wait on this conclusion before preparing my wax. The facts which led me to appear in his cell while there were yet five and thirty witnesses to be called, were plain to me in the list of women tabled for a hearing by the prosecution. They were four, much above average, in their looks, with money enough to show these to advantage, and all of them recent widows. It was as obvious as their heaving bosoms that they lined up as the Honourable James's winning streak, which now at last was ended. As I sat in my regular seat at the bailey, which the ushers are now kind enough to reserve for me on those days when I am detained by urgent business when the court first sits, you can suppose that I figured myself a pretty tableau for our show, with pink and blue lights playing on handsome shoulders. 
The public for wax loves a story revealing passion and equality. I am not insensible to it myself, more especially when I have been the architect of its presentation and am able to gloss it with anecdotes learnt from the mouths of the principals. Once having determined, or let vaulting ambition determine, the intention of a tableau, it behoved me to work with some expedition. My days I spent in making sketches of the prosecution's armoury of ladies, to play them into an extra dimension at my leisure. Otherwhiles, I was engaged chiefly with the accused man himself and, but I am not resolved to hide nothing, since my lady did not. She was gracious and complaisant enough to allow me the great bed itself, at cost. And previous to its removal from her boudoir, she attired herself in the same shift she wore on the fatal night. Thus, deliciously disposed, she assumed the posture of anxious vigilance she had taken while those two gambling men laid the burden of decision on a pack of cards. She was pleased as I worked to inquire if my mind dwelt always on the straight line to posterity, and in the same spirit I answered that I was able to find as much joy in the contemplation of the perfect curve of a posterior. The practice of my art necessitates on occasion some indulgence in sentiment. No concessions of any kind were required in furtherance of work on the centrepiece of my grand design, whose impact on an admiring world would be doubled if I could exhibit it for the first time on the very morning our egregious gambler finally turned in his chips. From the moment that I entered his cell to make his acquaintance, and he appreciated that the playing out of his hand was henceforth a mere formality, I had not the least trouble in securing his interest and support. In his solicitous care to ensure that I was master of every detail of mind and body, so that the facsimile might be perfect, his conduct was exemplary. Once he knew from me that he must hang, he showed the breeding of an earlier age, before the Jacobin virus infected the common mind everywhere with envy and hatred, and destroyed the belief of the aristocracy in their own blood. It is my opinion that nature intended the Honourable James to be a first-born son, for he was far worthier of the title than his elder brother. Once I expressed this view to him, and he replied that eldest sons were the real prisoners today of tradesmen and their columns of figures. He said it very well, considering that at the moment of the remark he was surrounded by walls thirty inches thick, and a ring of destruction even more impenetrable was closing in on him. An account of the whole life of the Honourable James is not to my purpose here. Though he supplied it all, when he understood my concern to be clear how flesh and skeleton might have combined or fought in his case. He told me all, and a tenth of it might have been enough to bring his trial to a summary conclusion, had I wished to retail it to the authorities. But of course his great quality as a gambler was the instinctive perception of every hand played, and he saw that I was among those who play for keeps. In my turn, I spoke with great frankness, and he paid me the compliment of being a most attentive listener. He was most admiring of my diligence in researching the byways of the penal system, and heartily entertained by my account of the intimate relationship I had undergone to secure a true wax of his paramour. More truth, perhaps, my dear fellow? He inquired at the end. Than you could expect wax to convey? which suggestion I was confident enough to deny. This assurance seemed to intensify the enthusiasm of his interest in the wax of himself, if that were possible. Such was our mutual encouragement and my absorption in my task, which I had begun to hope might evolve a masterpiece, that the court proceedings dwindled into the background as a shallow mockery of reality. The concluding speeches, the verdict and the sentence 
came and went as almost imperceptible scratches in the armour of our concentration. Though I was obliged for periods to break off, to secure waxes of the other ladies who must take a place in my tableau, they were cooked, one might say, as vegetable adjuncts in a heat controlled to perfect the roast. I owe the phrase to the ever-active brain of the Honourable James. It was a scene which must have affected even the turnkeys, had their fancy ever been capable of soaring free of those dreary catacombs. When two nights before the dawn appointed for his execution, I at last stood back from the wax, and he wrung my hand and declared that I only wanted breath to be himself. From the look in his eye, he added, he was sure the thing was pining for a gamble. In the fullness of my heart, I swore that if it were a gamble he wanted, as his last pleasure on earth, I would endeavour to provide him with one. He seemed struck with the idea, and paced about the cell several turns before speaking again. Then he came forward and put out both arms, said gravely, I am in your power, and dropped them again. He stood motionless, his attitude a replica of the posture I had given his copy. It was, naturally, an attitude very characteristic of him. But whether the urgency of completing my task had led me to overtire myself, or the burden of the impending break between us had suddenly become too heavy, I cannot say, but seeing the two of them, identical, resplendent with action, my head seemed to swim for a minute, and I was unable to distinguish which was the Honourable James and which the copy. I said nothing for a time. Had I spoken, I might have imitated those credulous visitors to our show who address the dummies in the apparent hope of communication with them. Then, after an unconscionable pause, he moved again, and I felt the warm blood of his hand on mine. You are a great artist, my dear fellow, he said, for you've put into the wax even those elements which you have never yourself experienced. That wax speaks the excitement of the gambler, about to make a great coup. I looked at the wax and thought it a fair judgment. I shook my head. The credit, I responded, belongs equally to you. You have entered voluntarily into the makeup of the wax itself. What a lark, he remarked, his lips smiling, but his eyes glittering with a quality deeper than laughter. If they should hang the wax and the original go free. I heard the words, but they merely echoed the message I had already read in his eyes. I said softly, speaking willy-nilly, out of habit, as a partner. Then my tableau would be missing its central figure. He laughed outright triumphantly. I will stand in its place. He stood back and observed me, and whispered, My dear fellow, I do believe you are beginning actually to experience the excitement of a gamble. Is there anything in this world to beat it? I must confess there is not, but it was his next argument which really persuaded me to throw in my hand with his. You have told me that it is Mr. Marwood's pride that between his entry into the condemned cell and the movement of his hand on the lever to let the trapdoor fall, a mere eleven seconds elapses. He is an old friend of yours. I make no doubt that a wax of Mr. Marwood travels in your show. If he were persuaded to join in, and I can muster a jolly sum to help him make up his mind, the thing might be done. And then, my dear old miracle worker, what a tribute to your art might be included in your epitaph. Of all my subjects, the Honourable James Beresford was the only one to have seen past the contours of my flesh, to the skeleton in me which lived before, and lives after. I shook his hand in silence, and the deal was made. Then we put our heads together for the details. The following night, in the early hours, which should have preceded the execution, my perfect work of art was laid under a blanket in the condemned cell, and I bore out on my shoulder the nearly naked, living body of the Honourable James Beresford, with his face and hands and feet lightly waxed over, and the rest of him wrapped in a canvas. 
he maintained rigidity of pose with the concentration of a gymnast. And before we made our exit, his muscles must have ached even more than mine. But for the rest, it was easier than you might have expected. For neither the silent prisoners we passed in their cells, nor the turnkeys padding down the corridors, were willing to gaze on even the wax of a man who must quit this life in a few hours. Indeed, I was already used to this reaction, for to them, no doubt, as I went out with my trophies, I must have seemed like the shadow of death some hours in advance of its time. At the gate of the prison waited the conveyance which I had arranged to remove us to the secrecy of the exhibition. This secrecy would be brilliantly cast aside under the eyes of the thousands we expected to visit us. A short hour after the news of execution was posted on the prison gates. The interval passed more slowly for us than it does for any condemned man. Albeit we were busy enough. For not merely had the Honourable James to be clothed in the articles the wax would have worn, but it was necessary he should stand on his pedestal and there be waxed over, early enough for the patina to be dry before the crowds should come to cast their rapt scrutiny upon him. I had little mental energy to spare for jokes, but the Honourable James kept up a running fire of pleasantries, even when the wax allowed only his lips to move. I remember especially that as he mounted his stand, he appreciatively surveyed the tableau and congratulated me on the circles of ladies. The fear that confronts me now, he said, is that this excitement will have its wanted effect and I shall give everything away by enfolding one of these beautiful creatures in my passionate embrace. The witticism was plausible enough to make me tremble and I begged him to face away from them if that were the case. He reassured me, saying that he was too old a gambler not to be able to distinguish between the game and the spoils. Nevertheless, it was some time before I could steady my hands sufficiently to proceed with my work. It was always chilly in that subterranean chamber, for we never allowed the heat of summer to mar the tone of our waxes. But for all that, a further sudden fall in the temperature seemed to invade the precincts as the first notes of Newgate's great bell, tolling for a departed villain, assaulted our ears. Briefly a faint ironic smile touched the Honourable James's lips, as the sonorous echoes swirled about us. His gaze settled on the Ormolu clock, which had once been on the mantelpiece of Marie Antoinette, whose severed head Marie had cast, and had passed into the possession of her executioner, and from him into my hands, when I took the impression of his severed head. The clock now showed a few beats before eight, and with every throb of its movement, the golden spot of satisfaction glistened more brightly in the eye of the Honourable James. But I could not smile, nor could my own dilated pupil have evinced other than the blackest and deepest horror. For in that chamber the sound of the street are never heard, much less the booming of Newgate's bell, which was a good cab journey distant from us. The awful clanging came from within. Without moving I could detect its source. Some years earlier we had cast a copy of the Newgate Bell to accompany a tableau illustrating the dreadful end of a lad of fifteen who had butchered a youthful companion in larceny in a jealous fit over the division of their gains. The clapper of this property, which had never moved before, now wildly swung heralding the death of a capital offender. But to judge from the ecstatic brilliance of his eyes, the Honourable James had no suspicion that he was here in not the dreaded reality, but a grimmer, weirder proxy. Then, abruptly, as I thought the breath I held must burst my body, the tolling ceased. It was immediately succeeded by the bright, tinkling chimes of Marie Antoinette's clock, announcing eight. I stood a few paces from the Honourable James, as rigid as the waxes. A strange alteration spread across the face of the man, 
as if the wax unreasonably were softening. A mysterious grey pallor came and went, as if the shadow of a pufflet of cloud had chased across it. The sequel was a swift infusion of scarlet, as when one of my apprentices miscalculates the strength of his dye. Perhaps I make an unreliable witness, for my amazement and horror were extreme, but it seemed to me now that no trace of his former gloating anticipation remained on the Honourable James's features, but had indeed been parcelled out among his motionless retinue of paramours. Then the eighth note sounded. His head jerked upwards, and his face was convulsed. Fissures appeared everywhere in the wax coating of his cheeks and forehead, and a hideous blasphemy exploded from his lips. It echoed in the stone recesses of our underground chamber, to linger afterwards in my brain like the startled cry of a man who falls among thieves where he had expected a friendly welcome. Then, as I stood, no more able to move than any of my creations, his body stretched and arched, spasmodically. One leg rose till his knee almost pressed his stomach and gradually subsided again. His tongue protruded from his lips, and in place of the stars in his eyes, I looked into the Stygian vortex of death. Waxen flakes scattered about the floor at my feet, as the centrepiece of my tableau crashed down from its podium and sprawled before me in unfeigned stillness. I had rather less than an hour in which to set matters to rights before the customers would pour in. I cannot say how many of those valuable minutes I spent still standing, aghast at what had befallen. I owe it to my experience in the early years of carnage and terror that I achieved enough to pass muster, and not one pair of eyes among the many discerning commentators who visited us that day ever guessed at the dreadful drama which had been enacted just prior to their arrival. But it was all singularly disappointing. The work of weeks had to stand by its journeyman effects. There was no life in the centrepiece. Several critics in their notices of the show next day drew my attention, and that of their readers, to this irrefutable truth, while the man from the Times commenting sympathetically on the devotion of my scholarly attention to detail, nevertheless opined in conclusion. In the last analysis, perspiration is after all no substitute for inspiration. It gave me my excuse for withdrawing the tableau from public exhibition, but it was obvious that I should have featured my wax and not the original. A gambler's whim had tricked me into losing a masterpiece. The proof of this claim is that in the prison that morning, nothing untoward was noticed. Mr. Marwood, the hangman, later reported to me that he had very speedily dealt with the corpse, beyond chance of discovery. Of course I showed Mr. Marwood, by raising a flagstone, the real results of his handiwork. I had thought Mr. Marwood to be made of sterner stuff. The sight must have addled his wits, for he never officiated with the rope again. But he was no great loss to any of us. What I think of the flesh and skeleton of Mr. Marwood may be seen by any man or woman who cares to visit our collection. Oh.